I'm looking forward to this. Thank so you very much, Sue. So thank you very much for having me and turning up today on a cold lunchtime. I'm sure there are other things to do, um, more exciting things to do. Well, obviously not more exciting than this, but um, thank you anyway. Um, so just to kind of lead on from what Sue said, um, um, I was quite involved in the RSA, not so much at the moment, but I have previously. I was the chair of the Fellows um, Council, um, the Fellowship Council for a while. Um, and it kind of gave me an appetite for this sort of work because the RSA is an organisation and has 27,000 fellows, many of whom are very keen to collaborate, um, and actually they find it incredibly hard to do. So it kind of um, gave me an interest in actually understanding that there's a lot more to collaboration than willingness. There is a whole lot of methods and tools and, and ways of thinking about collaboration, which is really fascinating. Um, and the whole idea of collaboration has kind of taken over my life, really. Um, so what I'm going to do today, um, I've left most of the practical activity stuff to the workshop at two, um, but I'm just going to share with you some thoughts and ideas which might be appropriate for what you're doing, might not be appropriate, but I'm going to share some of the things, the, raise, the ways that we're applying it in the work that we've done most recently. So um, just interrupt me at any time. I'm not professional enough that you won't throw me off my course, but I will hopefully go back onto it at some point. Um, yes, so um, Sue was telling me that um, one of the things that the Centre has tried not to do is to try and put forward a definition of what transdisciplinary is. So she told me that after I prepared my slides, um, and actually I do actually start talking about what people think of as... Um, I have started this more to do with um, in a kind of academic environment. Um, so just to give you just a little brief background of what um, what I do at the moment. I cook, I'm in your way, aren't I? Oh, no, no, don't worry. Are you don't sure? Worry about me. Not at all, Catherine. Well, I had a longer arm. That would help, wouldn't it? Um, maybe I'll move this out of the way. Um, so um, I call myself a social designer, and I see that as a kind of a new type of transdisciplinary practice um, which we're still kind of developing and thinking about. It's kind of more and more being reinforced that it's a kind of a whole set of skills or ideas which is, is, is not rooted in one particular discipline. Um, and what we do at the moment is we go and help communities co-produce their, communi their, their community. So largely they aren't co-producing the communities. The way the systems are designed, most communities are set up to compete with each other. Um, smaller groups competing for funding. Um, there was one example where we went up to Manchester and we were talking to a very well-functioning group who were very excited about the work they were doing. And we said, but, you know, we met these fantastic guys. They're like four blocks away. You really, you know, how come you guys don't know each other? And they go, well, they got funding last year and we don't speak to them anymore. So the kind of systems we set up are not designed largely to collaborate. And I think that in the university kind of funding world, there's a lot more emphasis on collaborative applications and things like that. Sue was talking about that earlier. Um, but it's actually how do you actually put that into, into effect, which is interesting bit. So we've done about 80 workshops um, across the country. Um, the story really is that... Hang on, I've left my... Can you wait here a second? Don't go anywhere. Yes. Oh, sorry. I produced this book collaboratively um, two years ago called Handmade, and it was really a collection of um, mostly projects, but some sort of thought pieces about projects which were doing things rather differently in the communities um, and a sort of local level, um, and were kind of doing things in what I determined was a kind of collaborative way, which was rather different from what was traditionally being done. Um, and that sort of turned into a project called the... Um, Community Lover's Guide to the Universe, and we've got 60 of these books which are being produced across the world at the moment. Um, Birmingham is coming out in January, um, but we've published um, Rotterdam, Utrecht, Amsterdam, Hackney, and Birmingham so far. Um, and this is an example of a kind of, um, this is 100% collaborative, so there's actually no funding, with the exception of a small amount from the Dutch government to help us with the website. Um, but we're producing these books and putting the stories online for free, using free technologies. Um, and it's basically a way of surfacing new kinds of knowledge about how people are doing things um, in different ways. So we're hoping, maybe by the end of next year or the year after, 
will have 600 to 1,000 projects documented about how they've actually progressed their project um, so that somebody who's interested in, in starting up a growing project locally can actually look on, on the website and see there's like eight different ways you could set one up and there are different ways of you know, progressing them and developing them and things like that. So it's kind of a, a surfacing knowledge through using technologies at the moment. So I took, I took this book, I kind of got infected with it because what it sort of posed to me was that if, if all these projects were done in one place, it would really transform the way people live. Um, and I got kind of infected with that idea. So rather than a dystopian future, I kind of got infected with the other idea that we might have a utopian future even though I think this whole kind of way of working is quite a vulnerable, is quite vulnerable. Um, but I went and took it on the road. I did this project called the Tra Travelling Pantry, which was kind of like a very public midlife crisis. So my daughter went to university and my son went to boarding school and I, on a Monday morning, I would take, uh, I would go on the road, basically. I'd had it all, I wasn't doing it just um, off the cuff. I had it all planned. Um, but I gave free workshops all over the country from Glasgow to Penzance to to Brighton, actually testing out some of these tools that I'd um, developed to see whether you could stimulate these kinds of projects together. So put a group of people in a room together and see if a certain way of doing things could actually have them do collaborate in a different way. So it was incredibly exciting. Um, it wasn't very lucrative, um, but it was incredibly exciting and it's really informed all the work since then. So we've just constantly been building on that. So that's Community Lover's Guide. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but collaboration, particularly in the sort of university context, is all about new knowledge. Um, so I found this rather good um, definition. In a given system or within a given discipline, new knowledge is generated by combining internal knowledge specific to this discipline and external coming from other fields and making tacit knowledge explicit. Um, so all the work that, that I'm involved in and probably most of the work you're doing, um, including teaching students or learning from lecturers, involves either transferring or creating new knowledge in some way. Um, so creating new knowledge involves combining isolated knowledge assets synergistically to produce new capacities, ideas and processes that existed neither internally nor externally. And it sounds very ordinary when it's kind of put in a sentence like that, but actually the whole collaboration, I think, you know, the core of it is really having a genuine belief that putting bits of knowledge together is a really worthwhile endeavour because a lot of people say that, but they don't actually believe it. You have to have a really strong belief that that collaboration is is got value. So here's the definitions, Sue. So <laughs> close my eyes. Close your eyes. Um, so this I took just from a particular paper, which I'm going to just talk, talk to you about. Um, he, um, it's by a paper written by Bruno, I always forget his surname. It's a very long Italian name. Bruno Della Cisa. And he, um, he did a very big project, uh, a European project, which was kind of, it had 25 countries working on it in the end. But it was really trying to create a new discipline around education and neuroscience. So um, this, this particular paper he wrote for the Mind, Brain and Education uh, journal. Um, and I was kind of sort of secondary involved in that. It's actually, the journal itself is based at Harvard University. But it's one of the, uh, it's one of the things that's really given me an interest in transdisciplinary work because it's so complicated and difficult that anything else you do <laughs> um, would seem easy. So this was his, this was his definition. Um, saying basically creating intersection in two dimensions and he's kind of saying that as though that's easy you know he's drawing this as a comparison um, that that sort of collaboration would be easy transdisciplinary he's done this fantastic diagram for us um, basically showing how very complicated it is but it's, a, but it's applicable in the mind, brain and education field because they are trying to actually create a whole new field from um, combination of those two things so in transdisciplinary, a new transdisciplinary field in its own conceptual structures is created through active cooperation and fusion of completely different disciplines. Um, transdisciplinary planarity is a dynamic concept whereby various dis disciplines are connected and ascended to a new discipline. So um, even without looking at those diagrams, you know that it's not complicated. 
Anyone think that it's this complicated? <laughs> um, so this is what he. This is the paper he wrote, and um, I'm very happy to send a PDF of it to Sue if you're interested in it, um, because it's actually unusual for people to write in journals about the struggles they've had collaborating with um, disciplines and different departments. So, and he's particularly um, open and honest about it. So basically, what they found was knowledge transfer barriers all over the place. Um, and these are, um, these are apparent in probably most of your work, whether you're collaborating or not, whether you're collaborating with students even, um, it's, it's apparent in all the work that I do, is that there are these, these barriers of, of um, transferring um, knowledge. So just a couple of examples, I won't go through the whole chart, um, but... Um, so inhibition due to myths, traditions, and groupthink. I think that um, certainly in the work I'm doing with trying to help local authorities um, collaborate more with local residents, they, that's one of the kind of really difficult things is that um, there are very strong beliefs um, and group thinks around what the community does and what the, the council does. Um, conflicts of co cooperation, defensive routines, um, and when they looked closer, um, they thought they'd try and find, they thought that the problem was finding a common language, but actually when they'd actually overcome the common language issue, they found there was a, a much more difficult problem was actually dealing with all conceptual problems. So the whole thing was very prob problematic all the way through. Um, so one of the things they noticed was that um, was the, the degree of participation. So they started out with five countries being involved in the project, with another 20 of them actually held back in terms of really getting stuck in. So they kind of signed up for it, but they wouldn't really get involved because they wanted to watch and see what happened. And that's kind of a characteristic I've seen quite often is that there, there is a group, and they're not, I don't think they're the same as the kind of early adopters, but there are people who are willing, much more predisposed to collaborate. Um, and then, but they, you know, the other 20 followed in the project. Um, so the neuroscience community, they asked three criteria of the people involved. Experts would, should be willing to, and able to share knowledge, um, able to adapt their language to, the, to a different aud audience, um, and recognize the long-term connecting information across fields is really valuable. And what they found is that they were nearly all of them very poor communicators. Um, and this might be significant to some of um, the work that you do, but one of the things they found was that younger academics and older academics were much better at it. Um, the sort of the group in the middle who were kind of still striving or had, had were sort of half established their careers and were half striving were kind of less able to communicate or less willing to impart knowledge um, because they were kind of still in a more competitive frame of mind, um, whereas the younger people and the older people, they'd either achieved it or they were still, you know, right at the bottom of the ladder. Um, and I think, I don't know if that's, anyone has observations yeah. in the sort of academic arena. It, um, it's kind of this willingness to share knowledge and information. Um, and he kind of... Um, says if education arrangements are working so well that everyone's happy with them, there would be no reason to look for new solutions. And I think that that is really common everywhere. If things were working in a transactional way um, very well, we wouldn't have to do collaboration. Because everything I know is that it's a complete pain in the neck. And if you don't have to do it, you really shouldn't. <laughs> um, but I hope that you'll, you know, I hope you'll find value in it. But it, it's a very complicated thing. Um, and the only reason why we're exploring it in such depth is because um, other systems aren't working so well. So um, this is one of my academic heroes. Um, I followed her around all her lectures in one particular conference. Um, but she's a really interesting um, person in the minor education um, sort of field because whereas Bruno was trying to sort of bolt neuroscience and education together and trying to work through collaborative kind of methodologies. Um, Mary Helen is actually, she was a teacher. She's got a 
a master's or a PhD in education and she's a neuroscientist. So she's doing a lot of the collaborative processing, if you like, between those disciplines in her head. Um, and I think the, the brain is a powerful processor of these kind of different disciplines and different things. Um, so I only, I only put her forward as a, as a sort of a contrast because I think you can get a long way when actually learning a lot from other disciplines and processing it yourself. Um, anyone got any comments to that? No? Demacio, didn't he write that book about how, how things feel or something? Yes, he's... Um, He's the, the sort of the first researcher on um, neuroscience and emotion. Right. So um, Descartes' area, I think he wrote. Um, but it is interesting because she, if you listen to her speak, you can actually see how she is actually blending these disciplines and actually converting them into kind of really practical applications. Um, and for the most part, it's converting these things into practice, which is the real stumbling block. So we can ha come up with a lot of theories, a lot of policy people come up with very interesting theories that seem very logical, but they find it very hard to put it into practice. Um, so I think that the knowledge barrier transfers are in, in knowledge building and research, learning and teaching and all forms of collaboration. Um, and it's actually how you blend knowledge which is incredibly difficult. So this is a project we only opened two weeks ago, um, just as an example of how we're trying to address collaboration in a very practical way. Um, and this is in, um, in West Norwood in Lambeth, I don't know if you know, anyone knows the area. Um, so we've opened up a shop, we've taken over a shop for two to three months. Um, and we are introducing the idea t to the local residents of collaborating with the council. Um, which is actually quite novel. Um, the Lambeth Council have been talking about it for two years and they found it quite difficult to actually make it real for people. So a lot of people we've been speaking to haven't ever heard of the Cooperative Council um, and that sort of frame of reference. So we, we've put definitions of co-production, co-design and collaboration on the windows just to kind of reinforce why we were there. Um, and it's been incredibly fascinating because we've had so many people um, through the doors and so many different sorts of conversations over the last um, in the last two weeks. Um, we're still kind of processing you know, what we've learned from it. But one of the things is that we're using the space and I think this, this building is an incredibly interesting um, potential tool and the, that in the way that you're using it of actually bringing people together in a conversation that they don't usually have. So one of the research studies I, I've read recently was that if... Um, if somebody sits more than 90 feet away from you in an office setting, that you've got the same chances of collaborating with them as if they lived miles away. And so we're just talking about how important proximity is, how this face-to-face, -face, um, not always purposeful, but actually you know, accidental contact can actually raise interesting conversations. Um, and... I think it kind of reflects kind of an emergent approach to things. So, um, when you talk about we, yes, is there a team you're working with? Well, I um, I run a thing called Social Spaces with a partner called Laura Billings. We collaborate with lots of different people, but at the moment we've actually been taken on as staff for Lambeth Council. Um, so we're actually working the policy department and we're implementing this project and we're working with a team within the council. And who made contact with the people from the community? Um, we did. Well, we basically just opened the shop um, and we put a program of talks and workshops and things together um, and we've just been making cups of tea for people for the last two weeks. Um, it's... Um, I mean, there's two projects which I was going to talk about possibly in the workshop, which I might mention now just as, a, as examples of kind of taking, that sort of informed this approach. One was that um, there's a place in Rotterdam called, um, where is it? Where have I got them down here? Um, the Mayor's Living Room. And um, it's actually a shop which has been taken over by a street of, of residents. And they pay three euros a month. Um, to have the space, um, try and find it. 
and they're treating it as their own community space and doing things that most people think the community centre should do, but actually most, most uh, community centres are service-driven establishments. They've kind of changed a lot over the years about the concept of it. I've actually heard in Israel uh, there are also some communities there who have, they club together and rent a house, which they make their community space. So all, all the, the case, some of the cases that I'll be talking about later is actually how people are creating their own spaces now in which collaborative spaces at, at local level. Um, the other one is um, in The Hague, and there's two um, retired um, urban planners called Willem and Noel who are the most delightful people. I kind of fell in love with them after about 20 minutes. Um, but instead of volunteering for projects, they've actually decided to rent a house in their neighbourhood um, and it was in between the mosque and the uh, Catholic church and they didn't do any engagement work. They just sat at the window and drank tea for about three weeks and so people started getting curious and knocked on the door and you know, asked them what they were doing. They were practising what they call presence, which is a, a sort of theoretical thing that one of the university guys has... Yeah. And they don't tend to, like, there's a Somali community centre, there's a Hindu community centre, yeah. Caribbean community centre, but they yeah. don't really seem to talk to each other or mix. So, how do you make something that's truly inclusive and bridges? Well, I think a lot of this is, I think it, there are a lot of places like that. And actually, the, um, those are generally much more um, community orientated in the, in the field that they create um, than. The, the traditional English community centre as it's functioning at the moment. Um, our challenge is to actually try and create spaces, if we can, that actually bridge some of those uh, I divides. They used to run a refugee centre that was very similar to this type of idea, but I know for a fact that a lot of refugees and asylum seekers are very sceptical of anything called authoritative, or what they see as kind of council run, etc. So they just yeah. wouldn't knock on the door yeah. Mm. Well, I think that um, I think that the purpose that we're trying to do with this is really to um, think about ways that we can actually collaborate with local residents to make new things. So it's not we knew when we opened this. Um, it's actually called the workshop, which we didn't name. Somebody in the comms department did. I hope he listens to this recording. <laughs> um, but um, we've been mistaken for a job centre and a one-stop shop. So one-stop shops are some councils have set up spaces where people can come and ask about their parking tickets or their council tax and things like that, so in one central space. But we've been very um, determined to actually have conversations not about those things, but actually about how we can collaborate better. Um, and we've been surprised at how receptive people are to it. Um, but in, on a sort of, tr on a knowledge transfer level, we're actually trying to uh, convey quite a big concept change to a lot of people um, and it's how do you where do you start with that and we think you start from you know your first cup of tea with somebody um, and do you know what I mean you have to start with conversation so it's almost using the space as kind of making the community conversation ready rather than actually jumping too far ahead it's actually starting with the smaller things um, oh yes Sorry. Yes. So. Um, yes. So they. Yes. Presence. So it was a university, I think, in the in in the Hague or Amsterdam, who has sort of put us this this idea forward of of actually being present and not always being out there broadcasting, pushing, engaging, which is kind of what we're all kind of trapped in to some degree or other. Um, and what's emerged from that is actually having the confidence that things will emerge through <coughs> this this new kinds of connectivity and. They've got about 20 or 30 projects running out of there from language sharing lessons to sports groups for their kids. Um, they do quite a lot of arts-based projects as, as well. Um, most delightfully, they've actually given away about 50 keys to the building, of which they have no record, um, which I don't think you could get away with in this country, but it's a real testament to the fact that you can operate like that. Um, and, and, and use that as a way of making a space kind of owned by um, a larger group of people. How did the conversation go when they people knocked on the door? When you said they picked up the door, what, what, how did the conversation transpire? 
I think they just had very gentle conversations about what people would like to do and what might be useful. They've actually sort of, if you met them, I'm not sure you'd be as equally charmed as I was in that they are incredibly, well, Willem is actually quite militant underneath it, but his manner is very gentle. Um, and I think that they, they've just, do you know what I mean? They've just softly come out of these things, but actually quite significant things where if you'd, if you'd started on day one, just plastered the window with, this is what we're doing, come and do this, come and do that, which is a little bit like what we did here. Um, um, you know, I don't think it would have worked as well. And it's also actually, it's, a, it's really an indication, along with most of the stories that are, are in the books now, of how people want to engage differently, participate differently in society. Because these guys, they could easily have donated some money to charity, they could have volunteered at a, an existing community centre, but they decided they wanted to create something, they wanted to make change themselves in their own way. And it's kind of really interesting to see how lots of people are actually trying out those things um, where they can. So in the, in the shop that we're working with, all the materials that we're doing, um, we've got installations and some activity sheets and things like that, but all of them are, all of them are pointed towards how we can collaborate. So <coughs> on this, right this left-hand one, we've got a range of 20 activities or so, and we're asking people to put on a, on a sort of line where they think um, the responsibility for that particular act activity could lie. So what can citizens do together, what can citizens do together with professionals and government, or what should professionals and government do. And this is based on one of the activities we've done in our workshops, where surprisingly the amount of difference there is around these questions is astonishing. You know, you'll have 20 people around a table and actually the, the range of difference, the range of argument people have about where you put that mark so you've got three headings, but actually people would want to move them with the cards, and it, as we have in the um, activity, they'll want to move it five centimetre one way or another, or half a centimetre one way. So actually people feel quite passionate about where these things are, and there's quite a big difference in it. Um, this was um, another project we did last April, which we still haven't documented properly yet, um, called the Ad Hoc Inquiries, and this I thought you might find interesting. Um, because what we were trying to do was to see if you could build knowledge in a social setting. Um, if you had two hours and you had 20 people around the table um, and you gave them something nice to eat and you, um, you had somebody who would propose a theory from their work. So it was actually seeing um, if people had done a, a practical project that they had some theories that they were coming out of it. They could present it to 20 people from different disciplines and actually get a response from them to see if we could actually build some knowledge. Um, and we did four of these evenings, which were quite extraordinary. On those nights, I couldn't sleep until about 4 o'clock in the morning. My head was so overstimulated. <laughs> um, but I think that was because I was trying to see it on all the different levels. So just to describe to you what we did, um, we kind of... We kind of used ta Bloom's taxonomy as a kind of overarching way of thinking about so that people could think about what they, would, what they were doing while they were listening to a person. So the person spoke for about um, 20 minutes. They present what they did and what they thought their emergent theory was from that work. Um, and then, hang on, where's my folder gone? I've hidden it again, haven't I? There we go. Um, so everybody was given an egg timer, um, so they were only allowed to speak for a certain amount of time. And I think we started off with five minutes egg timers, and we ended up with two minute egg timers. So each, each event we did, we changed it, um, so we could consider what worked well the first time, and then we changed it for the next one, etc., etc. So they all had a blackboard um, bat with chalk that they could give some com comments back while a person was speaking. So that's not intimidating at all, is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's sort of, it was kind of weird, it's loads of people, so just people just want to, you know, normally looking for nodding heads or something like that, so we, they, were, they had to put a tick or something on them, or a cross, um, and um, it, this worked to some degree, but not as much as we thought. The egg timers were fantastic, because it, made, it took the pressure off the facilitator, so everyone was kind of measuring their own time. I mean, there were some people who just, like, oh, whoops, I forgot to turn mine over. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, 
Um, but it was an interesting way of keeping tabs on the on the time. And then on the by the second t- the second evening, we thought the people were really enjoying themselves far too much, <laughs> and we were after there after all there to, to share, not build knowledge. You know, we weren't there for a social. So we put a bit more pressure on people. Um, and what we did was we printed the cards out with um, Bloom's taxonomy on. So we were asking them, so they all had a set of these. So before they spoke for their two minutes, they actually had to say what they were doing, whether they were um, applying some knowledge to what had been said, or that they recognized it, or they were making an interpretation. Um, so we were asking them in a way to be metacognitive while they were thinking of something clever to say. <laughs> Sorry, it's so funny when I think back. Because we, you know, we knew we were going to put pressure on, but I've never seen people concentrate so hard in my life, including myself, um, when we introduced these, because it's actually a really hard thing to do. Because you're kind of listening to someone, you're, you're trying to absorb what they're saying, you're trying to add something from your own knowledge base or your own discipline or your own experience, at the same time, you're trying to have to analyse what you're saying into, into one of these categories. So, yeah. What kind of people are they? <laughs> you're part of that. Well, um, most of them were in London, because we did it in central London. Um, and they were all from different disciplines. The, the, the main, the four people that we had in to give a theory were all related in some way to the idea of collaborating between... Um, local residents or citizens and local government. So we had two which were sort of senior people in local government. Um, we had an activist who'd been working in Peckham for years um, called Eileen Conn, who's an amazing person. Um, and we did actually have another person from, from Holland coming who's one of our partners in Rotterdam, and, um, but he was sick, so we were lucky enough to get Matthew Taylor stepped in from the RSA. Um, and so we had a range of speakers but the people were from all different fields they were from, we tried as far as possible to have people outside of the usual context, so we had people from theatre or design or science Um, we worked very hard to get a very mixed group of people to attend Um, they got very special invitations and do you know what I mean, they were actually knew that they were coming for a specific purpose and if they didn't come that there would be a kind of a hole in the evening this is not a criticism. No. But, so to a certain extent, they are a certain elite within their... Or, because I do quite a lot of work, or we are doing quite a lot of work in, in quite deprived areas, in, where nothing of that happens, um, and there is a resistance also about these kind of methods yeah. quite often happening. Yeah. And there might be other methods which are more accessible to that. Because oh, yeah. Because that needs a certain kind of framework already yeah. to be part of a certain kind of dynamic um, of, yeah. of working. No, agreed completely. And actually the, the original concept was actually much more to try to draw to find a way of drawing out the sort of more the community projects. That's where our intention originally lay with the whole kind of design of it. Um, and because we do a lot of other activities, we do 3D asset mapping we do all sorts of other collaborative activities when we do it in communities, um, which are, we do know, is comp- accessible. This is, this I felt, although we put more pressure on people by introducing this, um, I mean, I, we haven't kind of done the full evaluation. We're still um, sort of in the process of documenting it. We're trying to produce a book um, which documents all the the four different evenings so that people can see what was said and who said what and if what came out of it but I think it was only partially successful because I think if anything it went too close to kind of academic stuff and actually I think academics do it better do you know what I mean so it was kind of in this halfway house but it but it was incredibly interesting do you know what I mean? In terms of, of an evening out, it was much more participatory than if you came to talk like you are now. And it's lovely ideas with the card. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it did have an element of fun, but in terms of its, and as a kind of a participatory, sociable thing to talk about a specific thing, I think it's really interesting. In terms of knowledge building, I think that's where it's kind of got, it's in the sort of halfway house. Um, but it is, you know, it's trying again to try and see if you can build knowledge collaboratively and how you do that. 
and I'm not sure you can do it in two hours over soup. <laughs> um, but it, as I said, it was fascinating to see the difference in the evenings as we changed the timings and the order of things and introduced different elements um, and how it actually changed the dynamic of it. Um, this is a project we only um, started um, in November, and this is um, this is St Lawrence's Church in Norfolk, and they've been looking for a, a tenant. The church has been empty for 20 years. The Churches Conservation Trust have 350 churches around the country. A lot of them are empty. Some of them have found exceptional uses, like one of in, in Bristol is a circus school, um, and another place is um, a health centre. Um, but when we went and, and, and looked at Norwich, we found that there was, I think there's 58 churches in the town centre, and there's actually four in the same street as this, and they're not small either, they're all big medieval <laughs> churches. Um, so one had already been turned into an art centre, one was already being let. Um, so what we did was we've, we tested the idea of actually introducing a kind of collaborative economics, if you like, or collective economics, um, and we launched this idea of, the co of having a community common room, which sort of goes back to the idea of a community centre where people can drop in, where they can start new projects, test ideas, you know, where somebody can be fixing a bike in one corner, somebody might be baking bread in another corner. So it felt like that kind of environment. Um, so we did a, a prototype day, um, and which was incredibly um, well attended. We had sort of 200 people came. Um, and where it is at the moment is that a founding group has come together um, who want to start a cooperative in which to kind of develop the idea to the next stage. But it's the idea that we came from was a lot to do with all the research we've done into all these projects and all those trips around the country. It's actually getting a sense from people that they really do want to collaborate, that regular people aren't satisfied with the kind of spaces that they have at the moment. They don't, they don't want coffee shops or restaurants or go to people's houses. I'm not saying they don't want to, but they also have this real thirst for different kinds of spaces. Um, where they can contribute more, where there's a more permanent kind of sense of, of community there. I mean, another example is, um, you may have heard of it, it's called Men's Sheds, um, and there are 500 of them in Australia. Um, but they're set up as making spaces, as workshops, permanently. So they, they don't do what we do a lot here in this country, which is make versatile spaces where you can sweep out the playgroup in the morning to sweep in the WI in the afternoon. They're actually set up permanently. Um, and the advantage of, of um, men's shed is they've done quite a lot of research around it, so they found the well-being has gone up of people um, who were involved in it, and the well-being of the whole community has, and it kind of sets up a kind of collaborative space for people um, to do things. I'm done. <laughs> I'd just like to know um, what's the blooms of taxonomy, what this thing does it come from, why did you choose it? And how does it work compared to a kind of um, emergent sort of set of relationships? Um, Bloom's taxonomy was devised in the 50s, I think. Correct. Somebody else will know there's the answers to this. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and it was set up as a sort of taxonomy of, of cognitive processes and how we manipulate knowledge. So the first one, I think, is understand. Um, um, the other one is the next one. Hang on. No, remember. It's remember. Um, but I think it was, it was revised, I think, in, in 2000 and something. But it took them seven years to revise it, and all they did really was change... They stopped it being... Um, instead of saying applying, they changed it to apply. <laughs> um, but it's, it's quite a useful... It's a sort of a, a, a level of um, thinking. So at the top is create, but underneath is kind of... Um, Evaluate. So how did you find people responded to that framework? Well, everybody, everybody contributed. Um, everybody could kind of see what they were doing because I think even on the, particularly on things like recognize, um, if you can recognize what somebody's saying as something you identify with or you can connect with something you can work with, then they really responded to that. Or, I mean, I think that the whole. Um, the evaluate thing is the, was the most complicated one because the way it was structured, those evenings were structured, you were really setting it up as though it was going to be a critique because um, that's what people are really used to. They're used to people having 
somebody in a debate situation or something like that. So this is kind of an alternative to a debating situation. We were trying to be a bit rigorous, but you didn't want to set somebody up to put forward a, a theory and then just be criticised by 20 people. <laughs> um, so we had to be very clear when we you know, introduced it that there were, we wanted as many people to use other different forms of thinking about it. I spent 10 years working in community development and policy units in local government. And I'm really surprised that you've not mentioned anything about this very hierarchical, androcentric nature of the bureaucracy and the political structure that we that local government has to work within, which is very top down, representative rather than participative or deliberative. Yeah. And, uh, and it'd be really interesting to hear, because I know Lambert, it's pretty well, I work yeah. with Lambert. Outside the policy team, I mean, how, how, how's the rest of the council? I mean, do they just ignore you? Or are, you, are, you, are, you, are you engaged? <laughs> Would you ignore me? Oh, no. I, I, no, no, no. I'm being serious. I'm no, 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 serious. I know. No, I'm not being flippant either. Um, we've only been working with the council since August, and we have been in the policy department, and the policy department have really driven the cooperative council agenda. Um, and I think what's been interesting is that with the workshop, part of the kind of rationale for it was that we had we went and presented it to all the different departments and the partners like the NHS and the police and we invited them in to give talks or th asked them how it would be useful if they collaborated more. So we've kind of co-produced the actual project with all the partners. Um, but there's um, there's absolutely no doubt that there, there is a hierarchical thing that we are pushing against. Um, and even at community level, we're, we're pushing against that because um, the um, I can I'll, I'm sure you can circulate these slides. But one of the things which has come out of the, the work that we've done really is to the analysis we've done is how people participate or want to. It's not very easy to see that. I've actually got a few of these if you wanted to have a look at those. Um, sorry, I only have four. Um, really um, just to just very briefly um, so these these first four which is consumer representative charitable and challenge those are the ones which we've seen most um, most historically these are all really well established ways that we contribute to society um, this is through political social etc um, or we challenge with local authorities there's quite a lot of challenge going on particularly around planning applications and things like that. But this creative collaborative, we described that only as a result of actually looking at all these projects that we were studying, all these new types of emergent projects around the world, which were kind of building social capital and bridging communities and, and doing things in a different way. That they, The only reason for putting them outside of that existing framework was that they didn't fit in those other four things. Um, and we're kind of seeing emergent things where kind of creative collaborative is kind of mixing in with consumers to create the sort of collaborative consumption idea. Um, we're seeing a little bit about representative and creative collaborative. This, I think, is incredibly hard. I don't know how many of you are involved in any kind of representation groups, um, but even when I was working at the RSA, um, it was, uh, the, the Fellowship Council was um, predominantly a, a representative body. We were kind of representing the fellows. And actually, it's quite hard to actually get any kind of activity or collaboration going in that environment because it, it kind of comes with a whole set of... comes with a worldview. It comes with a whole set of behaviours which are really quite established or entrenched in some cases. Um, this is also quite interesting, which is where collect, creative collaborative might mix with charity um, and volunteering to kind of do collaborative social investing where people are actually giving to projects, not expecting... Um, a financial dividend, but also not doing it out of charity. So, and we've got examples where people actually are volunteering their time in a sense that they're not um, they're not being paid, but actually they're developing really creative projects, which don't fall into the idea of, of volunteering. So there's there's things that we're seeing emerging which don't kind of conform to what we expect. Um, and I'm not saying that any of these other things might. Uh, I think that, for example, I think representative is still incredibly important, and I think that it keeps people to account. Do you know what I mean? It's got a very important role, but I think a lot of the time we try and, and I've done it myself, try to subvert that into doing more creative collaborative work, 
and I'm not sure that that's, that's the right thing to do, not just that it's very difficult, but it might not be the right thing to do, that actually sometimes they might be kept separate. Next, the last question. Well, one, whoever it is, last question, because uh, we're at the half. Sorry, can I just say that uh, how, how often do you think that the, in the case of the, the, what you've described is you actually require some sort of nexus, some sort of agent, change agent to actually create the environment for this thing to happen? And obviously that person has to be outside the system, otherwise they've actually, you know, they come with some sort of either some view of things or they get seen to be come with some sort of agenda. I think the examples we're seeing very often are like that. But I think the, the potential really is to figure out if there is a role for the council to help support it or create an environment, a collaborative environment in which more of that activity can happen. But it does often depend on people. Yeah, just I think one of the elements which I think um, talks a bit what you said is the element of power and who holds the power. Because what we are, we are, I find it really interesting, but it comes from a different angle, I would say. Um, and it's about how you negotiate these different angles. Yeah. Because some people, um, I just have this case of uh, somebody who wants to set up a cycle group, recycle group, totally voluntary, collaborative. Yeah. The council comes in and says, you have to have somebody with a helmet, somebody who has this and this and this and this and this and all the structures. We, just, we don't want all of that, but they're coming with their power yeah. and their structure and yeah. their requirements yeah. into that whole debate and negotiation. Yeah. I think, just quickly, if that's right, so, uh, I think that this, the work that we've done has been very much outside of traditional community development work because we, although we recognise that, that the powers are... Um, the power dynamics are there, what we're trying to do is, is actually change the power dynamics rather than kind of work around them or navigate them. So we don't concentrate as much on the power dynamics as someone from community development looks more closely at that because we've, we've spent three years at community level visiting projects, working with communities, and we're trying to see if we can foster a, a collaborative culture with the local authority within that to help those two meet it's like there's some kind of conversion plug needed between the two to kind of, we don't know what that looks like yet. Thanks very much. I'm going to draw that to a close there because we have to have a, a, a break before Tessie starts in on a two hour workshop. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just for the minute, I'd like to thank her very much for that. Thank you.